Thank you for joining us for the CNBC Africa debate coming to you from the Summer World Economic Forum here in Dalian, China. We're looking at emerging markets at a crossroads in the context of lower commodity prices and tighter financing conditions. Joining me to take the discussion further for the next hour to my immediate right is President Arthur Peter Mutarika, the Honorable President of Malawi. To his immediate right, we have Chief Minister Rao of Telangana, Honorable Chief Minister. Her Excellency Helen Hai, Goodwill Ambassador for the United Nations Industrial Development Organization and CEO of the Made in Africa Initiative. Kevin Liu, who is Chief Executive Officer of Singapore Partners and also a young global leader. And Marcus Vinicius de Souza, Secretary of Innovation of Brazil. Mr. President, I'm going to take this opportunity before we jump into the broader discussion for you to give a little context around Malawi in the African context. Sir. Okay, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, Malawi is a country in Southeast Africa, uh, population about 70 million people, uh, a third of which is a lake, it depends on agriculture. A uh, former British colony, uh, became independent in 1963, uh, and for the first 20 years we had uh, a sort of authoritarian government until 1993 uh, when it became a, a democracy and the first free elections. Um, the fifth president of Malawi, elected in May 2014. Chief Minister, if you can do the same, sir, with Telangana, which is the 12th largest of 29 Indian states. Just a little context to our discussion as the Indian voice, sir. Yeah, the struggle for formation of Telangana state was almost a prolonged fight of one and a half decades. <clears throat> yes, I, I would like to say one thing here. Most of the people feel that this, it was a separatist movement. In fact, Telangana existed as an independent state before 1950. It was against the wishes of the people of Telangana with the <coughs> Andhra Pradesh, and the experiment was a miserable failure. That's the reason people thought that we would in our own state. Ultimately, we got it 15 months back. Last year, June, was the inception of the Telangana state, and the people are very happy now. Helen, let me bring you in here. <coughs> You have a dual voice on our panel today. You're going to share your China experience, your Asia experience, and then also your Africa experience. And your story is an incredibly enthusiastic one, having spent a lot of time in a very <coughs> successful financial services uh, career, and then taking the plunge and moving to Ethiopia to establish a shoe factory. I'm going to let you take the story from there. Okay, let me start with a real story, a real Chinese story happened in Africa. I came to Ethiopia back in 2011. It took us three months from design to investment to actual production. In the following six months, we doubled the export revenue for Ethiopia in the shoe sector. By the end of year one, we recruited 2,000 local workers. By the end of year two, we recruited 4,000 local workers. The question you might have now, why did we choose Ethiopia? The answer is, Ethiopia ranked 125 according to World Bank doing business. I did not choose Ethiopia, it was Ethiopia who picked us. The story started in March 2011, when the late Prime Minister Meles had a meeting with the chief economist of World Bank, Justin Lin, Lin Yifu, and asked Justin's advice in terms of poverty reduction and economic transformation. Justin advised him three things. Number one, job creation. It is the key for poverty reduction. Secondly, the fundamental secret for economic transformation in China in the 1980s and also Asia for Tigers and Japan in the 1960s because they captured the window of opportunity during industrialization shifting and they get into global value chain which they created millions of jobs and this enabled those countries for jump start in their economic transformation. And right now, China is going to relocate 85 million of the labor intensive jobs. Hey, so I'm there's gonna a jump in here because I want to keep on with this story and the success that you've had in Africa. Just one of the key stats is that in two years, you managed to double local employment in Ethiopia from 2,000 people on the local front in Ethiopia employed in the shoe factory 
to 4,000 people. And that's what we're going to talk about, manufacturing industrialization as a key theme with emerging markets going forward. Given a key debate point at the Summer World Economic Forum is the health of China. We're looking at official stats saying that growth will come in at around about 7.1% on a GDP front. Nothing to be concerned about, but weak world trade data, dropping industrial production in Asian territories, and certainty, certainly volatility in Chinese stock markets, perhaps pointing to a very different picture. How bad is it going to get? Yeah, my, my take, thank you for that great question. I think that's probably on a lot of people's mind the last few weeks, right? What's going on in China? Is the economy still under control? What's the long-term implication to other economies? Uh, I have a very simple take. I think what happened here is that what actually matters <coughs> In terms of long-term economic growth, there is no crisis whatsoever, in my view. I don't think if you look at all those economic metrics today, combine them together, compare that with what we had six months ago, there is very little material difference in, 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 on issues that actually matter, right? But for issues which, in my personal view, do not really matter, such as the equity markets in China, right, there was a crisis, there was a problem in terms of I think inflated uh, asset uh, sort of valuation and the government's attempts to try to manage that, sometimes more successfully, sometimes not. Right? In my view, that really does not matter for the global economy for a number of reasons. Right? The Chinese equity market is a much smaller, relatively speaking, part of the wealth accumulation here in China. The market itself has gone up tremendously over the last 12 months. This correction simply brought it back in somewhat. So to me, what matters, there's no crisis. What doesn't matter, there was a crisis, but somehow the, the, the global market mixed up all these things, right? In addition, on the RMB side, I think what happened the last few weeks was actually historical. The fact that Governor Joe was able to event, finally move RMB to market-based. So you're talking historic. about the devaluation 11th of August, 2% against the US dollar. Right, so I, I, I think even just label, that labeling in the media, called that event is called the devaluation of China, what was, was in, in my view, Are incorrect. we being too dramatic? Right. Yeah. I, I think to me, it's, uh, it's a shift, right, from a more controlled system to a much more market-driven system. And in that process, they introduced a one-time devaluation. And then since then, the market now for the last couple of weeks has been fairly stable, right? So for me, it's a paradigm shift towards a market-driven system, rather than, I think, devaluation is a small part of the story. And those people that are crying currency wars need to look rather for a 20 to 40 percent <coughs> devaluation of the one against the US dollar before we even touch that territory. Is that correct? I think there are certainly uh, theorists out there that argue for currency wars. Uh, I do worry about the currencies of some of the emerging market countries. Right? When you have markets react to what's happening in China irrationally, sometimes mixing up long-term issues with short-term issues, you could have vulnerable emerging markets countries have problems. But the China itself, to me, it's a very positive I'm actually move. siding with you there, and I'm saying that if it was a currency war environment where China was trying to steal exports, right. the devaluation would have to be dramatic, some 20 to 40 percent. It's only 2 percent, a right. tiny move, and as you say, just allowing the market to, to come to some sense of normalization. Marcus, let's bring you in here. Brazil is in a tough environment right now. Within the BRICS groupings, you are one of the economies that is contracting forecasts at 1.3% contraction for 2015. The Brazilian real, along with the South African rand, among the worst performing emerging market currencies. Let's get your sense of how you feel about China and the potential slowdown, as Kevin has alluded to, it's not as dramatic as everyone is making it. China is a key trading partner for Brazil. Yes, it is. Uh, actually, China is our main trade partner, and, and it's a complementary economy to Brazil because we export many commodities for, to, to China. Actually, 50% of all the Brazilian exports are commodities. And so China is the, the largest consumer of these Brazilian commodities. And, and I mean Brazilian commodities as soy, like oil, iron, and, and other ones. So uh, it's an important uh, trade partner. And for Brazil, uh, it impacts a lot the reduction on the, on the commodity price, not only from food products, but also uh, oil and gas. 
just to give you an example, uh, oil and gas industry in Brazil has GDP in 2000 to 13% of GDP now in this year. So it's because of the, we found uh, oil in the press salt area and all the, the supply chain uh, needed for, to explore these oil and gas uh, reserves uh, made this huge impact on the Brazilian industry. And when we see the reduction of the price of oil and gas, it impacts a lot many supply chains, mainly in the manufacturing sector. So you are very concerned right now about the health of China. Mr. President, let me come to you. And again, China has been involved with Malawi since 2007. Mm -hmm. We've seen China contributing hugely to changes in the socio-economic mm -hmm. landscape from a Malawi perspective. Again, you must be looking to China and saying, I hope that you are not in bad shape. Yes, indeed. Uh, China has been a partner with us since uh, 2008, uh, invested heavily infrastructure, also education and other areas, social areas, uh, medical services and so forth. So we do indeed, of course, we have free trade access to the Chinese market without reciprocity over 4,000 products. So any time the Chinese economy faces difficulties, it means, of course, we face difficulties. We have contraction demand, uh, we face difficulties. I, I know China is now moving from export when the economy to internal consumptive, consumptive economy. They have tried to do that, which means, therefore, that it's uh, probably harder for us to export to China, more difficult. So we do get concerned about that, but, but uh, we hope that uh, the situation can improve. Chief Minister, World Bank, IMF forecasts see India growing at some 7.5%. Mm. Prime Minister Modi saying 8.1% to 8.5% for fiscal 2015-2016. The key question is whether this growth is sustainable. It is off a low base, we do need to acknowledge that. But is it sustainable and will it be inclusive? Yes, we are very confident that we will grow further. In India, states have a major role to play. Realizing that the government of India has devolved more powers, more funds to the states <coughs> recently, and the Planning Commission of India has gone now. There is an organization called Niti Ayo, which consists of all the chief minister, the prime minister as the chairman. We call it as Team India. Chief ministers and prime minister as its chairman we plan the whole country's development and the state's development as well. So we <clears throat> definitely, in the federal structure, states have a major role to play. And for instance, let me tell you, I am a recently born state, 29th state of India. Though we are the newest and youngest state of the country, we laid down an excellent industrial policy. The policy says, we made it a law in the state legislature, in fact, that we have made it right to the investor to get the clearances within that stipulated time of two weeks. And we have given clearances to 56 companies in the recent past uh, to the tune of close to $2 billion investment. With this kind of approach, with this kind of mindset, this speaks the mindset of India today to the world. And I, I, I can certainly say, the market of India is a huge consuming market and exporting market as well. So we are stable. Definitely, we will continue to grow. We have a <coughs> prime minister who is on the path of reform. He is very firm. He was quite successful as chief minister of Gujarat. And we are quite confident that he is leading the country towards the growth. Kevin, if I can bring you in here, what traction are you seeing on the ground from a private equity perspective? specifically in Mumbai and further afield. So again, what you're seeing in China and in Africa. Sure, yeah, maybe let me first comment on Mumbai. Yeah, we actually, my, my firm, Partners Group, is a Swiss firm. Uh, we manage about $50 billion of pension assets all in private markets. Actually, our, one of our latest new office was in Mumbai last year. So we decided, we look around the world, we decided to add Mumbai at our 17th office because we, we see opportunities there. That, uh, that we as a private equity investor can, can tap in, right? So for us, the key is 
um, where can we find value creation, right? Where, where are the companies or infrastructure assets we as professional investor can come in and find the right price and then improve them and then grow them. So we, we certainly, we are quite bullish on, uh, um, on India and uh, as well as some of the other places. So what, what we do is we, we adopt a framework called global relative value. We basically look at those opportunities across the world and compare them and try to find opportunities. For China, let me, let me add a comment since you also asked about um, the way we see it as a, as a Western firm. Um, there are there's a couple of ways we could sort of play the, the China angle, right? Uh, the, the one that I'm personally most excited about for my firm is, the, is to explore the linkages between China and the rest of the world, right? So how do you, how do you buy a company in an emerging market country, for example, or a developed country, right? And then see how you can sort of deepen their link to China, whether it's have a bigger market in China, or find more suppliers from China, or find technology complementarity. To me, that's one of the biggest themes this sort of cross-border angle, or the, the other side of the coin is whether you find a ch Chinese asset and then link that up with an international asset, whether that's in India or, or, or other places. So for us as the investor, we, we're, we're quite bullish in Mumbai, uh, for, for India definitely, and, um, and for the China linkage story, we believe that's one of the biggest themes that, that's going to be there for the next Well, few picking years. up on that linkage theme, Helen, coming back to you, you are also advising the governments of Ethiopia, Rwanda and Senegal on setting up industrialization facilities or factories within their territories and uh, transferring light manufacturing or attracting light manufacturing potentially from the likes of China, as well as encouraging other investment, as Kevin was alluding to. Yes, uh, going back to the point actually, Professor Justin advised the late Prime Minister, once you know the what is on the how, how actually you start with. So the remedy he actually gave to the Prime Minister back in 2011 is, you need to create a quick success stories, because only quick success stories will bring inspiration, experience, confidence, to the country and to the continent. And that's actually what happened. Six months later, the prime minister went to China, invited a group of investors going to Ethiopia, and that's how my story started. But the story didn't stop after I created 4,000 jobs. Prior, I came to Ethiopia. Ethiopia have an industrial zone called Eastern Industrial Zone. They struggled five years to attract a global manufacturer to become a residence. After I created 4,000 of jobs, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia asked me to become his advisor. My first task is to work together with the government to promote the first government-owned industrial zone. With less than three months, without any advertisement, all 22 factory units, we leased it out to international manufacturers from Indian, Bangladesh, Turkey, China, Taiwan, all over the world. Why? Success brings success. And the leadership is behind the quick success. But another thing I want to highlight is that this just didn't stop in Ethiopia. And then back in 2013, the president of Rwanda, the president of Senegal, also came to us, asked our, our support. So this year, we built the first garment factory for export in Rwanda. Rwanda being a small landlocked country, we are taking cottons from Burundi, textiles from Uganda, and then we are making the production in Rwanda. So actually, through industrialization, we are making a small landlocked country into a land-connected country. And in Senegal, with the support of China, the government is building the first industrial zone. And I'm sure next year you can see thousands of jobs is going to happen in Senegal. And this is just didn't finish in Africa. The president of Ghana, the president of Ivory Coast, they all joined the race. So everybody's jumping on the, the industrialization. Bandwagon. Market, so Helen refers to quick success solutions that are needed. Can you talk to any potential solutions on the cards for Brazil within this emerging market grouping and potentially leveraging the linkages that Kevin alluded to? Okay, uh, actually we are now discussing our ministry, the new industrial policy for Brazil. Uh, our ministry is responsible for designing this policy and what we've been seeing is uh, a huge uh, change in what, where, what we are designing from the other old industrial policy. Uh, Brazil will have a industrial policy more focused on internationalization, so we would like to explore that our companies go abroad to compete uh, worldwide. Uh, this is a new shift in Brazil because Brazil has a huge internal market 
And so the companies are not so interested to explore other markets because you have a huge market, a huge domestic market. But what we are trying to do is, as a government, is to support these companies to go abroad. And when we go abroad, we mean not only making these companies selling abroad, but also establishing some important cooperation with the, co the countries that we are focusing on. Uh, as I mentioned in China, uh, at the beginning, 10, 20 years ago, it all began with some manufacturing plants and manufacturing uh, activities. But now what we've been seeing is to move forward to innovation projects, to R&D projects together with co Brazilian companies and Chinese ones. So it's a natural pathway uh, that as you are more confident with your trade partner, you make the relationship deeper. And for Africa, for instance, the, the, we as a government see uh, Africa not only as a consumer, but also as a partner where we want not only sell, but also to make them grow together with us. And when I mean grow and to support this growth is to give for African partners uh, also the help with small business entrepreneurship that we have in Brazil, with agriculture technical support with them. So this is a process where we want to grow together and not only sell for these countries. Kevin, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I just want to connect a little bit what, uh, what Helen and Marcus have mentioned about. Uh, Marcus talked about the deepened that trade relationship with China. And he Helen, basically, the story to me, it, it also means that the relationship, the economic relationship today between China and emerging market countries is far beyond just trade, right? Being the main trading partner is important. I've heard from a number of speakers today talk about China is either number one or the key or the main trading partner. But my point here is that it's a much broader story, right? What, what's happening in China, the implication to emerging markets is to put it simply, right? What, 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 what does China mean to, to, to the world or to emerging markets? You have 1.4 billion people that is moving from a sort of middle income country to a high income country, hopefully in the next 15 give or take years, in a peaceful way, with stability, and in a massive urbanization move, right? This creates demand for for goods from other countries, this cre creates a need for China to actually deploy capital to set up in a special in, in, in industrial zones. So it's it's a much more multifaceted a set of implications to the emerging markets countries. And for those countries, if they know how to tap that, right, go beyond trade, I think that that then they can reap the the the, the best benefit from 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 that sort of story. What's happening in China? Helen, we can't uh, pass up the opportunity to let you come in here. I know you're incredibly passionate on picking up on, on what Kevin is saying. I would like to echo Kevin's point by sharing some figures. Back in 1978, the GDP per capita in China is 154 US dollars, which is less than one third of the sub-Saharan African countries. In the past 30 years, China has went through a miracle in its economic transformation. Most importantly, 600 million of the people has been lifted out of the international poverty line in China. According to World Bank, actually if we exclude that number, the number of the people living under the international poverty line, which is a dollar and a quarter a day, did not decline since 1960. So the point I was trying to make, actually China made the biggest achievement in the development history. And now, if we look at China's GDP, last year is 7,500 per capita. And then according to forecast, by 2020, China going to be a high income country, which means China is going to move from a labor intensive economy to a more capital incentive economy. What does it mean? That means actually roughly 10% of your population is engaging in industrialization and then about currently China, that's 85 million out of the uh, 100 million are roughly in labor intensive. All of those jobs in China is going to go. Where are those jobs are going to go? This round of relocation is far more complicated than the last two rounds. When Japan was relocating, we're only talking about 9.7. When Korea was doing that, only 2.3. This round, 85 million. Some people say Southeast Asia, but Southeast Asia does not have enough uh, population to absorb those kind of jobs. Uh, Vietnam only 88 million, 48 and 14 in uh, Cambodia and Myanmar. So where is it? If you look at the population in the globe, 1.2 billion population in Africa, and most of them are young want, population, desperately need jobs. I want President Mutarika to come in here and give a little more depth and color.
to your relationship with, with China. We've already said that China is investing heavily into Malawi. But to take Kevin's point further and say that it's beyond just trade, there are relationships developing, skills transfer happening. Can you elaborate, Mr. President? We're trying to move into a skills economy. Um, um, not many of our students can get into universities, not enough spaces. So we have created these community colleges, uh, train people in all sorts of things from carpentry, joint engineering, and so forth. Now, we are cooperating with China uh, in terms of uh, training the trainers. In fact, this morning I was talking with one of the companies um, that uh, want to partner with one of our universities to, to train those people that are going to train in our technical colleges. So there is that cooperation, obviously, in that area, but also in education, uh, also in uh, medical training and personnel and all sorts of areas, including short-term courses. We send people, people work in civil societies, come here for short-term courses, and so forth. So it's across the whole spectrum of the economy that there is massive cooperation between China and Malawi. We're taking a short ad break. When we come back, more from our debate on emerging markets at a crossroads. And we'll be back shortly. See you on the other side. Welcome back to the CNBC Africa debate on emerging markets at a crossroads coming to you from the World Economic Forum, Summer World Economic Forum in Dalian, China. Kevin. Let's make this debate real. Where do you want to take it in terms of emerging markets at a crossroads? Do you believe we are at a crossroads? I, I actually don't believe emerging markets are at crossroads. I think if you look, again, as I, as I mentioned, if you look at the issues that matter in terms of economic fundamentals, whether you're talking about China or emerging markets, I think there are a number of growth drivers that continue to be there. People are moving into middle class, people are being urbanized, people demand higher living standard. I think all these drivers are going to continue to, to drive the, the economy of those countries forward. The, the question in my mind, the key question is, um, how does that connectivity going to play, right? We talk about the connectivity through trade, through investment. We can broaden that to, to people, to jobs, Helen mentioned, right? Or to uh, the softer part, the development policy. I think, I think that, to me, is the key question. Is the emerging market countries what do they take? I mean, China is, again, 1.4 million billion people moving a big train, moving steadily forward, right? How does the rest of the world capture that? How does the rest of the world benefit from that? That, to me, is the question. And one thing I wanted to point out particularly is that I, I think people tend to not focus on that because they take it for, for granted, is that China has been in, in a peaceful situation for many, many decades. Right? So people forget about that. People think that's always China has always been like that. But China was not like last in, in, in many decades before uh, what we have today. I think that's a, the, the stability dividend, in my view, is extremely important. It's been underappreciated by the traditional. So discourse. when it comes to our panel, who would you like to hear from in terms of engaging on your question? I, I think um, I certainly are very interested in hearing all three of them, um, the, the three from the other non-Chinese countries. Helen is clearly part of, a, part of the China story here, that on the, on the softer part, on the development model, right, which part of that developed model that China has adopted is, is, is relevant to them, and which part is not. To me, that's... So I think that was the point that uh, Mr. President was making earlier in terms of the skills transfer that is happening, the softer issues, not purely the trade phenomenon that everybody has been focused on. But as Kevin would like us to elaborate on this, Mr. President, can you talk a little more about the softer issues that are key to the debate in terms of China, particularly when it comes to Africa and Malawi being the voice within that Africa context. Could be more explicit what do you mean by softer issues? Policy, skills transfer, uh, Kevin? Yeah, I think, I think the question uh, I have specifically in mind is, uh, uh, I think everybody has been probably looking at how China has developed over the years, right? Which part of that experience is most relevant to Malawi? Is it the long-term mindset? Is it the ability to try and experiment policies locally? Or is it uh, uh, the peace and stability I mentioned? Is it that pragmatism that China has adopted? If you look at China, right, there's no ideological baggage whatsoever 
right? I think the, the philosophy here is whatever works, let's try it. A success it. story. So a success what can story. you draw yes. from in yes. terms, I think you need to maybe distill the, the question site slightly and look at the Malawi context yeah. in terms of what you're drawing from the China success story that Kevin is expounding on. Yeah, I think China has been very pragmatic in its policies, very little ideology, certainly a market-oriented economy. In, in the past, has been export-oriented, but recently have begun to change into more internal, expanding internal market, which I, I, I think is good. Now, now for us, uh, emphasis, most of China has been rural, and there have been a lot of emphasis on road development in China. We are doing the same in Malawi, moving people from the cities to the rural areas by moving jobs, institutions, and also some amenity to the rural areas where most people are. And in those areas, we are providing people, as I said, with skills, with access to education, medical services, and so forth. So it's a very people-oriented economy. For us, what matters is that, in my case, I want to say five years from now, when I, I leave office, people say they're better off than they were five years earlier. Uh, so my interest is uh, a society where people are happier, where people are happy, uh, where they talk about a good house, a good car, a good children going to school, good roads, and so forth. People are happier than they were before. Get so transferring a, a, a happier from a low society, income less miserable country society. to a middle income country. I'm sorry? Transferring or transforming from a low indeed, income country indeed. to a middle income country. We, we, we hope to do so no matter how you define it. I know our neighbors have been defined as neighbor, as middle, middle income countries. Malaya has not. But when I go to those countries, I don't, I don't see much of a difference. So it depends on how you define it. Uh, but certainly what I'm interested in is that people have better incomes, uh, people have better services and people will be happier. We don't call, call low income, middle, it doesn't matter the numbers that matter, but I think what matters is the welfare of the people. And that's what we're trying to do in Malawi. And Chief Minister, again to Kevin's question on the, the softer issues that you can draw from the China success story, the enormous success story that it has been to this point. It was a nice approach, pragmatic approach of China. They have shown the steep growth. Of course, recently the market says something, but it's not a worry. It should not be a worry for China also. These ups and downs are normally seen, normally observed. And uh, what I believe is the way China pursued, 30 years ago there was a different China. Today the world sees a highly grown-up China. One should learn, but not to be learned from China. We can learn everything from China. Marcus, still trying to fuel the debate in the vein that Kevin wants to take it, success stories that China being your key trading partner, as you've already established, what are you going to take away on the softer side? Okay, uh, well, uh, actually what we have been doing in Brazil in the last 15 years is the opposite as China has did. Why I say that? Because in the last, in the last years, Brazil focused on the internal market. So it was focused on consumption because uh, we had a, a huge growth, uh, a growing middle class that started to consume. In the last 10 years, 36 million people started to consume products that they never dreamed about it. And all this growth has, has uh, fostered the Brazilian growth. Uh, but now what we see is that it's reaching a limit uh, in the consumption. So we have to change to investment perspective and in the soft side what we, what we will do is to improve the business environment because to, in order to have competitive companies you have to have a competitive environment so we have to deal with a better uh, regula regulations for for companies better regulatory framework and laws and so all this regulatory framework to make business easier in Brazil will be our focus in the next years this together with the investment focus that we are dealing with. And the, in two, two months ago, Brazil launched a huge investment program on infrastructure. Uh, it's around 200 billion uh, reais, that's around 60, 60, 70 billion dollars, in order to make the private sector invest in many areas in the infrastructure. So that's what we are focusing on now. If, uh, if China is considering to explore their internal market, we did that in the last, month, in the last years. And now we are turning the opposite.
to make our infrastructure better and our regulatory framework more, more business friendly. Helen, that talks to the theme that you are advising African governments on. Again, I mentioned Senegal, Ethiopia, and Rwanda. You need to be open for business. Yes, um, I think private sector, they did not come to Africa to do aid. They come to Africa to do business. But through business, they achieve the development goals. If anybody telling you running a factory is very easy, that must be lie, which I'm going to come down to the soft uh, side of the experience. When I first came to Ethiopia, I met the prime minister, the uh, ministers, and then they told me, Helen, you are doing 100% export. All your raw material will be tax free. But in reality, it is not the prime minister or the ministers sitting at the port clearing my goods. It's somebody probably only 20 years old something, and then you ask that person make a decision he never made before. It's not very easy. So I have the brush to brush the shoes. They say this is the brush to brush the human teeth. It need to be taxed. I have a machine to make a hole in lady's shoes. They say this looks like a gun. It's a weapon. It's illegal. You cannot get it cleared into the country. So what I have to do? I have to personally meet the director general of the tax, get his organization chart. Understood, he has six deputy director generals. And I want to meet each of them. And when I meet each of them, I get the names and the telephone numbers of the next two layer managers below each of them. And then I gather these 20 people into a big meeting room. I prepare a presentation telling them who am I, why I came to the country, what I've done, what am I going to do? And most importantly, the problem I have encountered. And afterwards, I invited all of them to the production line, seeing from the beginning to the end. And then everything become rosy. At this moment, you're probably wondering, why did you took all those effort to do that in Africa? The thing I want to say, two things. Number one, there's a big information asymmetry when you are outside and when you are inside. What people know? Uh, about Africa when you are outside. War, disease, corruption, poverty, that's probably all we know. But while I'm inside, I'm seeing a different perspective. Uh, according to most of our panelists, is still going strong. Although, Marcus, you are concerned and you're watching very carefully considering the, the trade linkages uh, with China, specifically for Brazil. Let's come to the other part of our task, and that is tighter financing conditions. How are those going to impact emerging markets? And here, again, Kevin, I'm afraid I have to refer to news flow. Much is being made of the imminent tightening of US interest rates and the impact that that is going to have on financing in emerging markets. I'd like to get your views, sir. Yeah, my, my personal view on this is that I think the, the, last, uh, uh, the last number of years, I think we, we have been in a sort of abnormal state in terms of the cost of capital, right? So we, as, uh, as, uh, as a private equity investor, certainly feel that in terms of, uh, frankly, it was relatively easy to raise funds the last few years. With because, interest rates close to because, zero. Exactly. One can't close. argue with that. Right. So for us, if we deliver to our investors low 20s yields for private equity, they're very, very happy because there are not much terms. So I, so I personally, I think two, two things here. One is that I believe the world has to come back to the normal at some point, right? I, I don't think we can expect what we have today to last for 10, 20 years. Um, but secondly, I think the, the impact on the, on, the, on, on the businesses, the way we see it, is that most of the businesses we work with have factored that in. Because you know, if you are a good uh, business manager, you will not assume your cost of capital to be close to zero in, in, in the long run. So, so the impact, hopefully, is not as dramatic as, as some people would, 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 would have thought. That, that would be my personal view. Marcus, could you weigh in with your view on the US tightening interest rates and, and what that means specifically for Brazil, case in point? Yeah, uh, right now in Brazil we are struggling against uh, an economic crisis that we consider in the short term economic crisis, but we had to leverage or to increase our tax uh, or interest rate in Brazil uh, in order to make the, the, the uh, debt control in, in our country. So uh, today, Brazil has the first or second lar uh, largest interest rate in the world. And what we are doing is, is try to, to, to make some fiscal adjustments in our economic policy uh, in order to have a long-term sustainability in, in our finance, in Brazilian finance. So uh, of course, it will impact 
because if they do that, they increase the, the interest rate, we have to increase more. It will impact our companies that need this interest rate to be lower. And all the economic cycle will deteriorate in the, in the short term. So uh, I consider it's a risk for, for Brazil to have this increase in interest rate. Marcus, surely not a, a rosy picture coming from Brazil's corner. Chief Minister, if I can ask you to come in India, when you see US interest rates starting to increase the impact that it'll have on you, sir. India is mainly a consuming market. It will not have a major impact on India. Of course, it may have little impact, but we are not worried of these filing rates. Can you weigh in from a Malawian perspective, Mr. President? No, I, I think both the same. Uh, I don't expect to have much impact on us. Uh, we are not really big players uh, in the sort of those markets. Um, we depend mostly on uh, the kind of investment coming from Malawi, for example, is government to government, for example, ex export import banks that want finance from China here and so forth, or European investment bank, or African Union bank, world bank. So we don't expect the American situation to, to affect us in Malawi. I don't think so. Coming back to depreciating currencies, because again, if we see that US interest rate hike coming to fruition in the latter stages of this year, chances are that will strengthen the US dollar, again putting pressure on emerging currencies that are already experiencing pressure. But they can capitalize on what we've been speaking about, on manufacturing in their countries and exporting. Kevin. Yeah, I think, I think the, 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 the currencies are, are, are very important to watch, right? There are a lot of implications, as I mentioned, particularly for the more vulnerable part, the, the weaker part of the emerging economies. I think you do worry about that sort of uh, mentality driven by, by sentiment, right? Uh, but I think looking at the fundamentals, you know, uh, I mean, one day, I think people now probably mostly uh, looking at the US dollar, how that moves, right? I think eventually the world will be more diversified, right? I, I think this probably bring me to a, to a bigger point, right? That, that US dollar has been the currency for, for the world to use. People use that as a benchmark. Are we, are we higher? Are we lower? But I think the, the way the world is moving is moving towards a much more diversified way. Um, you know, I guess the bigger philosophical question is that if, we, if the world moves that way, what is the role of the West, right? In the past, the capital resides in Western cities, the uh, markets operate in Western financial centers, the rules are defined by the West, the currencies we use are from, from those countries, but I think going forward, those are all going to be you're going to be going through some changes. It's not an unlawful. Well, switch. I think it's unfair to take our debate there because unfortunately I don't see any representatives <laughs> from the developed world sitting on this panel. And we're all pro, the panel is very pro emerging markets in this space. So absolutely, the dollar may wane in relevance down the line, but right now that's not the case and it is a talking point in terms of tighter financing conditions for emerging markets. Let's move on now to structural reforms. And Chief Minister, I'm going to come back to you here because India is a net importer of oil. Right now, you can capitalize on the low oil price. So where other emerging countries that are dependent on oil for their revenues are battling because of the low oil price, you are benefiting. How are you shoring up your finances? The point that was made by Marcus in this easier environment to ensure that when we see a reverse, if we do see a reverse of oil prices, you are still su sustained at current levels. We strongly believe that we will grow and the trend is in our favor. We are the biggest oil importer and the oil prices are down now. We are very happy for that. We will certainly make use of the situation and continue to grow further. This is to our advantage. Mr. President, are you being able to capitalize on lower oil prices? Because generally, in many of the emerging economies we're talking about, we haven't seen the structural reforms necessary for you to capitalize on the lower oil prices to transfer into GDP growth. And here I'm talking about electricity shortages, um, uh, lack of investment in education and health, in infrastructure. Are you able to capitalize on lower in oil prices at the moment? Yeah, I think to a certain extent, yes. Uh, so far, we haven't felt it yet. Uh, it's very recent, but obviously, it affects the domestic economy in, in the sense that we'll make 
paying less uh, for oil and that money saved can be used for other things, for education, as you say, health and so forth. So to some, some extent, yes, uh, that would benefit from the low prices and we hope it continues to go lower and lower uh, and uh, the savings we use from that can, can be transferred to other aspects of the economy, structural reform, education, training, and so on and so forth. Helen. Talking about economic reform, uh, I actually, when I talk to the ministers in Africa, I tell them, I spent 12 years in Europe, actually, also had my exact MBA from the top European schools. But if you ask me actually to compare entrepreneurship from Europe model and Chinese model, I would give you the following example. If you have a tiger in front of you, and the European entrepreneurship, they will ask you, get your laptop, study carefully the characteristic of the tiger. And then you decided how are you going to conquer the tiger. But the problem is, when you finish all the study, the tiger might be gone. The Chinese entrepreneurship is very different. You have a tiger in front of you, you jump on top of the tiger and you ride it. And then Africa, emerging countries, they're crossroads trying to figure out what is your spirit when you have a tiger in front of you. Very well put. Uh, Kevin, yeah, does I, that I, ignite uh, more debate? Uh, I, I think, I think that's, that's a very important part of the mindset, right? The, the, the opportunity cost, which is, uh, which is not totally abnormal, right? Well, if you are a very developed country, that you, you, your risk appetite is probably very, very low. You want to figure out exactly what the fine prints are before you do anything. But when your living standard is so low, you want to try whatever works. But I want to come back to the topic of the structural reforms, right? I think Marcus mentioned about what Brazil is facing between consumption and infrastructure. This is clearly one of the biggest talks for China as well on the other way, right? I just want to say on that, I, two things. One is that I think China is one of very few countries um, who has taken this very seriously in terms of actually trying in the long run to try to adjust the economy in a different way so that the economy will continue to grow. Number two, though, I think the, the whole talk about rebalancing away from investment slash export towards household consumption, in my personal view, is a very long journey. This is not something China can just switch it on or switch it off. This will take decades to China to get to the level of some of the developed countries. Therefore, my personal view is that investment is going to continue to play a very big part of the Chinese economy, which is why I don't actually worry about all these things in media about bridge to nowhere, towns nobody live. You know, 15 years ago, uh, New York Times front page article was Pudong is a ghost town, right? And today you, you, you go to Pudong to find, to find the ghost. Good luck, right? They're full of people. And, um, and uh, so I, I, I continue to believe the investment, infrastructure development, the, the hot part of the economy will continue to drive a big part of Chinese economy while they very gradually increase household consumption, which is linked to many other social aspects such as well, welfare system, healthcare system. So to me, it's a very long journey. They will get there, but anybody who thinks China can just switch it off, I think that's completely unrealistic. Valid points made there. And I think we're going to move to closing points from each of our panelists. Mr. President, I am going to start with you. I'm going to go back to the question at hand, emerging markets at a crossroads amid lower commodity prices and tighter financial conditions. Your final thoughts, sir, as we leave investors in this room looking at the emerging market picture, and if you can weigh in with the Africa story. Well, uh, first of all, in, in Africa, it's, let's take Malawi, for example. Malawi depends on one major crop, and that is tobacco. Uh, tobacco brings in 60% of our foreign exchange, um, and yet it is a crop that's controlled by the buyers. We have no control on the prices or how much they're going to buy, because unlike any other commodity, tobacco is not subject to any international commodity agreement, as well with tea, cocoa, coffee, or cotton, and others. So we depend on that, and therefore, for us to survive, we have to depend on conditions in other countries, how much they're going to buy the tobacco. Uh, the same with the second biggest earner, which is uranium, uh, for example. Now, at the moment, it has stopped because of world conditions after the accident in Japan, prices have gone up, so for us it's zero. So whatever we do with respect to commodities, it depends on others, other factors outside. And I think that's a real challenge. How do we change that? It's very difficult to do. Talking about those linkage, linkages and maybe having to stimulate internal demand to secure yourself from external shocks so that you're Indeed. not at the mercy Indeed. of other countries' fortunes. Chief Minister, your thoughts 
India, I'm putting the question again to you. Emerging markets at a crossroads, lower commodity prices, which obviously you are benefiting from in the oil context, and also tighter financing conditions as we threw forward to earlier in the debate. Final comment, sir. Maybe other economies, other countries are at the crossroads. But definitely, I can certainly say that India is not at crossroads. We have a decisive part. As I have explained to you, the government is on the path of reform. We are moving undeterred. And as you mentioned in your comments, we are saving a lot of money on oil imports. With that, we have a scope to create more infrastructure for the poor people. And India is marching towards inclusive growth. We attach utmost priority for inclusive growth of the society. We believe in that because structural <coughs> changes will take place when poor remain poor and rich become more rich. That will be a cursing point which, which is undesirable. So to grow in a <coughs> um, continuous manner, to grow continuously, we should maintain the equilibrium, taking care of the poor, improving the dignity of the poor. Suppose in my state, though I am a new state, I have started a um, two-bedroom house for the vulnerable and disadvantaged communities and we are spending a lot of money on providing drinking water and also creating infrastructure for the city of Hyderabad and laying down a very good industrial policy. I appeal to the world business community that India is fairly good play to invest. I welcome all to come to India in general particular in particular to Hyderabad, Telangana, where we have a huge land bank and the policy which is nowhere on the world. There are single windows in the world, but the single window of Telangana, I can certainly say it is without grills. And the officer who delays in delivering the <coughs> uh, required permissions, allocations, he is going to be penalized. And we made it as a right to the investor to get the required permissions, required allocations, required clearances within the stipulated time. Otherwise, it is it can be deemed and the business house can move ahead. I can welcome you? I welcome the business world to come to India, come invest in India, invest in Telangana. Let us grow together. A gracious invitation from the Chief Minister. We have got two and a half minutes for the rest of our panelists. Helen, if you could come in, please. I'm a believer in strong leadership, sustainable commitment, and successful examples. And I believe that is going to bring emerging countries from vision to action, from dreams to reality. Kevin. Yeah, I think if emerging markets have what Helen mentioned and entrepreneurship and long term mindset of policy making, I think topics such as financing condition and commodity prices will be overcome. And number two, I, I think um, China and India will continue to be the engine of the growth. Yeah, we, we, have, we, have, we have more than two billion people, again, raising their living standard, create, create a lot of opportunity for other emerging market countries. If other countries can find the right way to connect to these economies, I think their fundamentals will continue to be strong. Marcus, finally to you, sir. Okay. Uh, I don't believe that we are at the, the emerging markets that are at crossroads. I think it's a bump on the road that we are facing. A and bump on the road. Yeah, it's a bump on the road because this crisis is not so serious as other that we ever seen. Um, as I, I used to say for companies that want to invest in Brazil, uh, despite of the crisis that we are facing, uh, it's a short crisis, the population will not disappear, the consumers will continue to grow, and the most important thing moments of crisis that, like we are living is what we learn from this crisis and what we learn and what we correct in our economies and how we don't repeat the mistakes again. I think these are the main lessons that we can, uh, we can have in, in a crisis moment and we are learning a lot in Brazil. Brazil will get out of this crisis much stronger than we, we used to, to be before and not only because the government is making some correction measures, but because the society is pushing, has learned a lot, and is pushing the government to make the right things. So uh, I think we have a huge potential, and we, will, we as uh, emerging markets, will not stop to grow. 
Well, I think that uh, sums it up perfectly. It's not at a crossroads when it comes to emerging markets, but merely a bump in the road. And I want to draw now from an HSBC report in 2012, which uh, threw forward to the fact that three billion people are expected to enter the middle class ranks. Three billion people are expected to enter the middle class ranks by 2050. The key point here is that almost all of them are coming from the emerging market space. That is certainly not a growth story to turn away from. On that note, thank you so much for joining us for the CNBC Africa debate coming to you from the Summer World Economic Forum here in Dalian, China.